As we were driving to the convention, I was thinking about eternity and even making several notes on the subject. And then Pastor Holmes spoke on the subject of having an abundant entrance into the heavenly kingdom, into heaven in Second Peter chapter 1. And these were verses, actually, that I was going to give the graduating class, and so he kind of brought them out. But I would like to look at these passages here in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 through 11. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter one verse four through eleven, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue and to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fail, never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, I want to have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. And Peter gives us some nice steps to accomplish that, doesn't he? If you do these things, you shall never fall. Well, I'm going to come back to these verses later on. Back about 15 or 20 years ago, actually my wife said it was over 20 years ago, but we married a couple that lived in our neighborhood, the old neighborhood we used to live and neither one of them was saved. Uh, neither one of them had been married before. It's kind of an interesting wedding because after we agreed to marry them, then they said, well, would you marry us on the, the, the fairgrounds down in Meadville? And there was going to be a steam show there. So we said, okay. So we went down to this, the fairgrounds and and a big steam show going on there. And we had a little corner of the, the arena there where we were going to perform this ceremony. And, of course, a couple came riding in on a steam tractor, and the whistles were blowing and, you know, all of that. Uh, and as I began to perform this ceremony, the director of the fairgrounds, he looked down there, and he he saw what was going on, and he came running down and gave me a mic. Well, this mic went throughout the whole fairgrounds. So I could hear myself a quarter of a mile away speaking. So everybody on the fairgrounds heard the whole ceremony and prayers and exhortations and everything. And the couple was crying. They were very tearful, and they were very touched. And then later on, even different people on the fairgrounds, they recognized us as the ministers. Of course, we were the only ones there with the suit on. So, uh, and they were saying, you know, how nice it was. However, this marriage was short-lived, lasted about a year. And the husband just died here recently. But I had a chance before they were married to to ask them about putting Christ in the center of their marriage. I said, you know, you're, you're, you're beginning something new. It's a new beginning for you. And I said, why don't you put Christ in the center 
of your marriage and give your lives to Christ and allow things to go well and have a strong marriage and so on. <clears throat> well, they kind of looked at each other and and the fellow said, no, he says, I'm not really interested. And his bride, she saw his response and she said, well, I'll do what he does. And so they decided not to receive Christ. But now he's in eternity. And from what I understand, he never did make a decision to. He never changed his position from receiving an unbeliever, I mean, remaining an unbeliever. He rejected the only means that one has into the eternal kingdom to be saved. So he will be in hell. And a million years from now, he'll still be there. And when the million years is up, it's still the first day in eternity. You know, eternity is like the universe. There is no end. It goes on and on. And in the past, people have thought, scientists have thought, astronomers have thought that they found the end to it, but there really is no end to it. I mean, when you consider the, the vastness of, of the universe, it reveals eternity, it really does. There's no end to it. Just looking at the, the Milky Way, for example, they say there's about maybe 400 billion stars in the Milky Way, but if you were to travel across the Milky Way, just the Milky Way, at the speed of light, what's the speed of light? 187, 186,000 miles a second. Traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, it would take you 100 million light years to get across just the Milky Way. And there are other constellations that have over a trillion stars in them. But, you know, people often reject the knowledge of God and creation story. But the older that I become, the more I am aware of how perfect all of the creation is. I mean, people that believe this all was just a fluke and it just blew out there. I mean, with the precision of everything and the uniqueness of everything that God made, it would take a lot of faith to believe that. It would take a lot more faith than what I have. I mean, when you consider the incredible detail of the creation, the senses, ability of the animal kingdom, for example. Senses, abilities that dwarf we as humans. The bat, for example, can hear 23 times greater than, than we humans. I mean, if we heard a, a pin drop 100 feet away, um, they could hear it at half a mile away. Uh, it's like their hearing is like sonar. Or the eagle, for example, can spot a mouse from a mile up. I mean, that's spectacular vision, isn't it? You have birds and animals that have infrared vision they can see at night better than we can see in the daytime. Geese that can fly six miles up where there's no oxygen. Um, you know, 30,000 feet up they fly. Or creatures that swim miles below the surface. Even submarines can't take the, the pressure down there. These are all thoughts that were kind of flooding my, my mind as we were driving toward the convention. Or creatures with built-in GPS that can fly thousands or travel by sea thousands of miles and find their way back to the spot they left. I mean, that's pretty spectacular, isn't it? The Arctic Turn 
can fly from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back. I don't know what they do down there. Maybe it's mating business or whatever they do, but they're flying like 10,000 miles down and back, and they know exactly where they're going. I mean, they have built-in GPS. Um, somebody was telling me about how that they were studying a, a woodpecker. They were telling me how they were convinced of God as the creator by studying this woodpecker. That this woodpecker can, can peck 20 times a second, up to 12,000 pecks a day, and drill a hole, and then... I mean, it takes fantastic... Uh, uh, I don't know what you would call it. I mean, the skull and the brain and everything that can take that kind of vibration... It's fantastic, isn't it? But then he drills a hole and he can stick his tongue as uh, his tongue has a little glue on the end of it that is like gorilla glue. Uh, grab a hold of this insect and pull it back in. And this glue is so sticky that it would it should glue his bill together. But when he pulls his tongue back in, there's a solution, saliva, whatever, that rinses and neutralizes this glue so that it's fine. Uh, but when you look at the minute details of everything that God made, to think that that's all just evolved would take incredible faith. A lot more faith than what I have. I think it's a lot easier to believe that God designed the whole thing. Amen? And then when you consider the universe as well, um, the precision of it. We, I know we used to set our, our national clock in the Naval Observatory in Washington by a star in heaven, and they would adjust our clock to about 50 thousandths of a second according to the star. I mean, everything is precise, precision. Um, just to think that all of this could just happen or just was some big explosion it takes incredible faith. Looking at another little passage here in Psalm 8, but all of this makes us aware of the eternalness of God's kingdom. And that's my point, that our God has always been and he ever shall be. And he designed every minute detail in this creation. This is David in Psalm 8, beginning in verse 3. He said, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained. And when you think, too, that he, he named all of these stars, um, and that's what it says in Isaiah, that he named them all. I mean, if you think of just the 400 billion stars in the Milky Way, it would take you 13 thousand years to, to count them if you counted one every second. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet all sheep, oxen, yea, beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And God gave man dominion over all of these creatures. But, again, coming back to the eternal purposes the Lord Jesus Christ said in his Sermon on the Mount that heaven and earth shall pass away before one jot or tittle, that's one dot 
or one crossing of the T pass away from his word because God's word is more accurate than even the heavens are. And it says that in another psalm as well, Psalm 19. Let's look at another passage in Psalm 102. Psalm 102, verse 25, 28. Are you flashing that? Oh, good. Verse 25, Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. I'll tell you, that this is the group I want to be in. Uh, the natural earth and the atmospheric heaven where we're at shall perish and change. But those who are belong to him shall continue forever. And I know this is elementary, but I'll tell you what, somehow uh, I think the older you get, I've lived my three score and ten just about here, um, you think about eternity. You think about the choices that people make. You see what people have done with their lives. And we want to have that abundant entrance into the kingdom. Amen? I mean, God has given us the ways and the means to attain. And as Peter uses the word diligence several times in those passages, we want to be diligent about our spiritual life here. But the children of the kingdom shall continue forever. Now, coming back to our originating verses here, um, in First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. <clears throat> you know, we want to make our calling an election sure. Part of our election resides in the moving of our own will. And... There are certain precepts that we want to apply as we have them here in Second Peter 5 through 8, adding to our faith virtue and knowledge and so on. The Lord wants us to have an abundant entrance into heaven. We don't want to be ashamed when we stand before the Lord, or even worse yet, we can miss it totally and not even get into heaven. But Peter uses this word, diligence twice in this passage, spude, which means speed, and it's talking about being in earnest and complicity to God's purpose, that we need to take our spiritual experience seriously. And especially in these days, because you can see the way that things are going in the world, and you can see the spirit of error, and you can see the message of the flatterer going out today and deceiving people into thinking that they're going to get there no matter what, which is a lie. We play a part in our destiny, don't we? In verse 10, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Make your calling and election sure. We want to make our calling and election sure. We play a part in this. I mean, some people think that it's all um, divine providence and God 
He wants you to get there, you'll get there. We play a part in our destiny. Make your calling and election sure. And it calls for diligence, doesn't it? We have to pay attention to our spiritual life. But there's another message today being promoted by the flatterer. You know, this is the message of the last days. I I went to uh, Singapore back a few years ago. I don't remember the time anymore. but And I was preaching on the flatterer. I didn't realize that there was a man there, a minister there, that fits the ticket and draws a large crowd. I mean, I don't know if how popular he was at the time. But it seems as though the flatterer is is like the last of the temptations here on the journey. You see uh, you see Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress. And the shepherds warned carefully these pilgrims about the flatter. Watch for the flatter's net. And somehow they, they weren't paying attention to this man, the, the shepherds. And they got caught in the net. And, you know, here's, here's a couple of pilg- pilgrims that were paying attention to the journey. In fact, they were absorbed with this journey every day of their life. It was as though they were consumed with their journey to get to the celestial city. They were doing everything. But somehow they didn't hear this message that the shepherds warned them of this flatter. And so they got taken in this net right towards the end of their journey. And fortunately, the Lord comes by or an angel of the Lord comes by and he cuts them out of this net. They got taken in this net. And their response was, we never could believe that such a fine spoken fellow could be the the flatterer. Well, that's the whole thing. You know, that's, he's got a message that makes you feel good and you don't have to worry about whether you're going to get there or not, because, oh yeah, God loves you no matter what. But listen, that's not the gospel. God loves you no matter what. Yes, God loves the sinner at the door of salvation, and it's unconditional perhaps at the door of salvation, but not for somebody who's been walking and been in the kingdom. God loves those who keep his commandments and obey him. And... Of course, they had to pay a price for what they had done. The Lord made them get down, lie down in the path, and put a few stripes on their back. And they were happy. They went away rejoicing that God had got them out of that that net. They went away rejoicing, even though they had a few stripes on their back, because uh, they 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 were gone. I mean, they were netted. But today we're hearing a message that God loves you no matter what. Past, present, future sins doesn't matter. You don't have to repent anymore. You're, you're in. It's a nice, smooth, easy, attractive message to people that are uncircumcised in their hearts. I tell you what, I would rather listen to what Peter said. Make your calling and election sure. Don't be taken in by the flatterer's net because it's a popular message out there today. We want to experience verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We want an abundant entrance. There's a group on the other side that's waiting. They know he's coming and they're rejoicing and they can't believe that they're getting the reception that they they got because they consider themselves to be quite ordinary pilgrims. 
But they were faithful. I mean, yes, pilgrims do make mistakes. But there was a wonderful reception waiting for them on the other side of that river. They had an abundant entrance into the kingdom. Now, in visions, people have seen across the river before they've died. And just like uh, uh, Pastor Rob Ayer's wife, uh, uh, her mother, right? Was it her mother that, or his mother? Oh, his, his grandmother, I'm sorry. <clears throat> but as she was dying, she was looking across the river and she was saying, Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. She was looking into heaven. My great grandmother, the same way, she was, before she died, she was looking across the river and she saw heaven on the other side and she saw relatives, different ones that were waiting. They knew she was coming. And they were all kind of waving and they were singing a song and she tried to hum it before she died. Uh, hum along with this song she heard on the other side of the river. But I tell you what, when you think of the horrors of not crossing the river into heaven and going to hell, um, my God, We want an abundant entrance into the heavenly kingdom. We want to hear, indeed, well done. I've seen this in a dream. I saw the end of my life, and, I, and I've said this. Even though I saw the end of my life, I still know in my spirit that I'm not there until I'm there. I'm not taking anything for granted. Because God can show us something, and then if there's disobedience... People don't get there. And, you, you know, it's a scriptural fact that God has said, well, I'll give you this and this. And they didn't get there because they didn't uh, listen to the ifs. Right? There are ifs. If you do this and that, you shall. And you can have this and that. And they were given these promises. We don't want to just get there. Like the story that we've heard, I probably told it before, and some of this might go out on YouTube. But here is a woman. She's praying for her husband. For the whole of their marriage. I will say 40, 45 years or whatever. <clears throat> and he, he doesn't want to hear it. He, he's not, he has nothing to do with the gospel. And but she continued to pray right up until he died. But right before he died, he, he finally is convinced that he doesn't want to go to hell and he repents and, and the Lord receives him and, and, uh, he dies. And then the wife who had prayed for him all these years has her eyes opened up and she sees him in heaven and he's speaking to her in heaven and he's saying to her, I made it. You know, he's kind of surprised himself. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm here. I'm in heaven. And he said, but, you know, he said, I'm here with everybody just like me. He was in a section in his, in probably in the Beulah section, waiting for placement uh, with people that just slid in at the last second, you know, on their deathbed or like the man on the cross who repents at the last minute and he, he just gets there. But I'm with people just like me. I've seen people in heaven too that didn't get God's best. And one particular brother looked very sad. Now you say, well, you know, you don't get sad in heaven, but initially people are very sad and disappointed because they realize I should have been here and I'm here. And they're, they're very sad about the whole thing. Yes, the Lord wipes away all tears, but you know, that's their place in eternity, many levels in heaven. 
And we don't want to be those who didn't finish what God gave us to do. We want to make our calling, calling an election sure. I usually don't <clears throat> because all of our people, and we have a number of people missing today, but I usually don't give salvation type messages. But, you know, we want to be sure, even today, if there's anybody here that has never made a commitment or is not sure or not living where they should be, now is the time to do it. Today is the accepted time. People put things off. Well, I'm going to do it later on. And It's like one man told me that I worked with uh, back in my meat cutting days, and I had to fill in for a vacation and went to Ohio. I told you this story before, but as I said, this goes out to other places. So I worked with him that week, and I was trying to witness to him. And he said, yes, you know, I love Billy Graham. I love to listen to Billy Graham, which is nice, but, you know, just loving Billy Graham doesn't get you to heaven. Um But he said he was going to make a commitment when he retired. That's what he told me. And so I worked with him that week till Friday, and then I came home and went back to my regular store on Monday. And when I came in, the boss said, well, he said, I have some bad news for you. I said, well, what happened? He said, you know, the fellow you worked with last week, he died over the weekend. He's 42. He wasn't looking for that. He said he was going to wait till he retired. Well, he had an early retirement, didn't he? That's why we don't want to mess around with eternity. People just don't know. People walk out of services sometime and they, well, put it off and and they never get home. So... We want to have an abundant entrance into the kingdom. We don't want to play around with our eternal life. We want to to keep the commandments so that we can have right to eat of the tree of life in heaven. Amen. In times like these, you need a savior in times like these you need